people who made food, that kind of stuff. There's actually a whole range of jobs, a whole range of kinds of lives there. It may sound pretty bad, but get this. People came to the slum because they thought they could have a better life. They thought they could have a better life and then they would, if they stayed in a rural area trying to farm. So ultimately, what was so terrible about this place? To me, yeah, it looks pretty awful right from that picture, but to me, it wasn't just the sewage. It wasn't just the incredibly cramped quarters. It wasn't just the fumes and the paltry wages. What was really terrible about this place, in my mind, was that no human being should have to live like this. No human being should have to live like this. And yet for most people in a slum, they had no better option. They were poor, and so they had no other choice. Okay? Now, what I want to talk about is how to think about poverty. Like, what is poverty? And going from what I just said, we're going to talk about how poverty is a bunch of different things. And you'll see ultimately it leads to where I just left off. Where I want to begin is, poverty is not just about money. I think that if you talk to your parents, your family, your friends, people on the street, you would say, what's poverty? And they would say, it's not having enough money. Okay, sure, that's part of the definition. It's actually a definition widely shared in that like, the academic and the policy communities use money as the main um, criteria for finding poverty too. The US Census Bureau, the US government uses money as like, income levels as the definition of poverty. It makes sense in some ways, but what I want to tell you guys is that poverty is not just about money. And using money to try to understand poverty is inadequate for all kinds of reasons. I'm just gonna mention three. The first reason that money is not an adequate understanding of poverty is that income definitions of poverty misconstrue what well-being is. They misconstrue what poverty is. And here's the reason why. Having enough money does not necessarily equate to a good quality of life. You could say, well, yeah, wait, but if I have enough money, then I actually have some options, right? I can do stuff. And that's true. Um, if you have enough money, you probably have more choices that you can make. But money is not a sufficient indicator of uh, the kind of life you can really have. It doesn't necessarily translate to quality of life. The reason is that money is actually only a means to an end. Having enough money is not an end in itself. It's not a guarantee of well-being. So again, if you're thinking about it, you'd say, well, all right, well then, Curtis, what's the end in itself? I would tell you that the end in itself, what actually we all want, is not money, but what we all want is to live a life that we value. What we all want as human beings is to have choices and opportunities for our lives. And money, it only partially gets at choices and opportunities, yeah? Now the second reason why money is not sufficient to define poverty is actually about measurement. And it's this, monetary measures don't count people who are poor in other ways. There's other ways of measuring poverty and money doesn't always overlap with those. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine a person who is reasonably successful in economic terms. So let's say she makes enough money every month that she's above <coughs> the income poverty line. She's not poor according to income. But let's say that this person has AIDS and yet can't afford medical treatment. Or let's say that she occasionally suffers bouts of malaria. Or that the political system of her country doesn't let her vote, let her voters speak freely. Or let's say her husband sometimes gets drunk and comes home and beats her. Now, my point is not to draw like a really depressing picture. My point is that even if this woman has enough money, she still suffers from all sorts of other deprivations, all kinds of other ways that hurt her quality of life. And so we really can't say that she has adequate well-being, that she's not poor in some ways, even if she has enough money. And this insight has actually been corroborated in studies. Lots of different studies have found this failure to overlap between income measures of poverty and other measures of poverty. I'll just mention one. There's a study in South Africa that found that 11% of the population there was poor by income measures. And 11% were poor according to this measure of the multidimensional poverty index, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. But only 3% of the population was poor by both measures. 
What does that mean? It means that the income measures were failing to capture people who are actually poor, okay? There was not consistent overlap. That means you've got to have other measures of poverty. And the last reason why you shouldn't just think of poverty as about money is because often poor people don't even use money as the main definition of poverty. There's another study in South Africa, a different one, just also happens to be in South Africa, in which the researchers asked poor people there, what are the 10 essentials of life? They asked poor people, what is the really counts in life? You can see how poor people answered. It's in rank order. The thing that poor people said is the most important in life is decent housing and shelter. The next thing that's most important in life is food and clean water, work and jobs. And it's only number five that you get to money and income. Then, of course, clothes, education, schools, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. But again, the point is that there's all these different aspects to poverty than just money. And in this case, poor people themselves will say, money isn't the primary thing. It's so important actually to ask people, ask poor people what they think, what their definitions are, and I'll return to that in a second, okay? So I hope this gives you some idea of why poverty is not just about money. Now also in terms of defining poverty, I want you to understand that poverty is multi-dimensional. What that means is that there's different aspects to it. So these 10 aspects, those are different dimensions of poverty. And if you really want to understand poverty, you have to factor in these different dimensions, different aspects. You have to factor in different measures, as I've said. And so I'll tell you about a couple of measures. You may have studied some of these already. Um, it's good to have a view of the different actual statistical uh, indicators for poverty. The first, maybe most famous, is this one. Um, people who live on less than $1.25 a day. People who live, live on less than $1.25 a day are considered to be extremely poor. And here's a map of countries by the percentage of people in them who live on less than $1.25 a day. You want to be blue, right? If you're blue, you don't really have people living in extreme poverty. You don't want to be this kind of brown, right? So Madagascar, uh, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, lots of people on less than $1.25 a day. One um, advantage of this measure is that it allows global comparisons like this. So you really can't see, well, where are people living in income poverty? So it's useful, right? I'm not saying income measures are not useful, but you have to take them in addition to other things. In fact, one thing you have to take them in addition to is the Human Development Index. I think some of you guys read about this, right? The Human Development Index. Does everybody remember what the different statistical uh, pieces are that go into the Human Development Index? There's three things. Yeah. Literacy rate. Literacy rate, yeah. So measures of educational attainment, good. Anything else? Well, bravo for you for getting one. Yeah, so income actually does factor into this Human Development Index. So gross national income per capita in US dollars. And there's also life expectancy at birth. The Human, the human Development Index is actually a measure of well-being. And here's a list of how countries stack up. The top countries and the bottom countries. So you can see there at the top with the highest human development index for 2013 is the socialist paradise, paradise in Norway. Anybody been to Norway? Oh, they all had it all, yeah? Everybody there is very happy, right? Everybody's got enough to eat and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then next, the land of kangaroos and koalas, Australia. And number three in the overall HDI of the United States, right? Am I right? Awesome. America. Yeah. Um, most of the countries at the top of the list are in Western Europe or the uh, settler states of the former British Empire, but you also get Japan in there. You can see that all of the countries at the very bottom of the list are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and unfortunately Niger here, kind of West Central Africa, brings up the rear. Now, um, Americans can look at this list and go, yeah, I'm free, all right. But um, there's another human development index that's also worth considering, and that's the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index. And because we have a high rates of inequality in this country, when you factor in inequality, the US actually drops from number three to 16th. Not looking quite as hot anymore. So inequality measures are another important way of getting at well-being and poverty. And the most famous one is called the Gini coefficient. And here's a map of countries by the Gini coefficient. What this Gini coefficient actually measures is the statistical distribution of wealth in a country. And it ranges, if, like, if you were zero, 
that would mean that all wealth is equally shared. If you had 100, which never actually happens, that would mean that one person, i.e. Bill Gates, has all the money, right? In practice, though, values typically range from around between 25 to 65. The U.S. has a Gini score of 45, which is considered high income inequality. Canada is 32.6, so Canada's kind of low middle. Canada is doing a lot better than the U.S. Mexico is 48.3. In general, as you can tell from this map, you want to be green. The green countries have relatively low income inequality. You don't want to be kind of purple and red. South Africa has some of the highest rates of uh, income inequality. There's also measures of gender empowerment. And I'll just show you one. And that's map of countries by gender inequality. And this particular gender inequality index uh, rates countries by the extent to which women have the same opportunities as men. Here again, you want to be green, particularly dark green, right? So you can see that Western Europe uh, and Australia and New Zealand have, actually Japan too, have the best uh, equality for the genders. The United States, not doing as well as those countries, but if, you know, I suppose we can take some solace at least we're not doing as poor as uh, some of these countries in Central Africa, in the Middle East, or in South Asia. But these gender measures are also really important to get at uh, poverty, because it, uh, worldwide it's very often women who suffer from poverty to the greatest extent. Now this is just a quick overview of some different measures. There are many, many more, and I think some of you eventually have to do like a country study or something like that. And if you want to get a picture of poverty in countries that you study, you need to look at a bunch of different measures. Things like the HDI, things like the Gini index, things like you know gender empowerment measures, but there's all kinds of other things. Health measures, like rates of child malnutrition, infant mortality rates, adult mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, that kind of stuff. There's really important education indicators that I would suggest you look at to get an idea of uh, how people are doing that way. The proportion of pupils in grade one who reach grade five, adult literacy rates, mean years of schooling, all that kind of stuff. It's really important to get a statistical indicator of poverty and well-being in a country. Now, that's important, but I'm gonna tell you also that you can't just look at numbers. Statistics are great. Quantitative data are great and very useful. They allow nice maps like this. But that's, again, only a partial picture. And I think it's really, really important to look at qualitative data, which is to say non-quantitative data. Uh, stories, what people themselves say. And there was a team from the World Bank that conducted about 20,000 interviews around the world with poor people. The objective was to find out what poor people said constituted poverty and constituted poverty. And so I want to um, share this information with you because it's the critical thing that you have to do, which is actually listen to poor people and listen to the voices of poor people. So poor people around the world said consistently, poverty has these problems, corruption, violence, powerlessness, weakness, and bare subsistence. And like I said, I want you to hear the voices of poor people here, what they actually said about these things. So listen to some respondents, some people from the study and what they said. There's a person in Bulgaria who said that corruption is virtually everywhere. And a person in Uzbekistan said that the police have become the rich people's stick used against common people. That's corruption. Poor people have to deal with corruption very often on a daily basis. Violence. Poor people fear violence in society and in the household. A person in Ethiopia said, women are beaten at the house for any reason that may include failure to prepare lunch or dinner for the husband. That's a kind of lack of security. There's other lack of security, too, that poor people worry about. A woman in Brazil talked about a lack of security in basic living conditions in terms of her shelter. She said, when it rains, the sewage runs in your front door, and water floods into your house, and the water and the waste brings bugs, rats, cockroaches, spiders, snakes, and scorpions. That is a basic insecurity of your house. If you're trying to live and there's scorpions crawling around, I mean, you're probably poor. Um, in terms of powerlessness, an old man in Nigeria said that poor people consistently feel themselves ignored by government and by non-governmental organizations. And he said this, if you want to do something and you have no power to do it, 
That is poverty. So the voices of poor people defining poverty. Also, this World Bank team asks the poor people around the world, what is well-being? What do you want for yourself? What does a good life look like? And this is what they said. Poor people said material well-being, physical well-being, social well-being, freedom of action and choice, and security. What do those things mean? Well, again, I want to give you some of the voices of poor people, what people themselves said. So material well-being. A person in Ecuador said, that is a livelihood that will let you live. Physical well-being. There was a man in Egypt who told a story that was what life is like when you don't have physical well-being. He, he said that my children were hungry and I told them the rice is cooking. But we didn't have any food and so they fell asleep from hunger. That's a lack of basic physical well-being when you can't even feed your kids and you just have to tell them to go to sleep because you have nothing else to do. Social well-being. A person in Ghana said, it is neither leprosy nor poverty which kills the leper, but loneliness. Freedom of action and choice, this is a really important one. And a woman in Brazil defined freedom this way. She said, the rich person is the one who says, I'm going to do it, and does it. The poor, in contrast, do not fulfill their wishes or develop their capacities. And finally, in terms of security, a person in Russia said, security would mean the absence of constant fear. So what this person meant was living in poverty means living in constant fear, okay? So these are these qualitative ideas of what poverty means. Luckily, these have been taken into account in constructing a relatively new statistical index, which I think is the most important and most powerful way of actually measuring poverty around the world. And it's called the multi-dimensional poverty index. You can see what goes into it, right? Um, there are health dimensions, there are education dimensions, and there are living standard dimensions. And then there are these statistics that are all computed to give an overall index measure of uh, poverty in multiple dimensions and then the intensity of poverty. And I'll just show you the countries that come out worst in terms of this multi-dimensional poverty index. There'll be some familiar names, unfortunately, because they're all in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see that Niger, uh, here, as of the Human Development Index, comes out worst. What this means is that, if you look here in this column, 92.4% of the people in Niger live in multidimensional poverty. 92.4% of the population. In other words, almost everyone lives in multidimensional poverty. <coughs> and what this column means is the intensity of deprivations. It means that like about 70% of people suffer multiple, de multiple deprivations in Niger. Um, these things can be mapped. Uh, and so you can see where the countries in which poverty is most intense, but you get an idea here uh, of the places in the world where people are suffering the severest and deepest deprivations in terms of poverty. Okay, so we've established that poverty is not just about money. We've established that poverty is multidimensional and you need multiple measures. But here's the other couple things I want you to know. Poverty is both chronic and temporary. What does this mean? Some people are poor throughout the whole year. So they just never have any money, for example. Or they're constantly sick and can't get treatment. Or maybe they're illiterate. Or they're subject to discrimination and violence. Those people are chronically poor. They're poor throughout the year. Now some people are only poor at certain times. They're temporarily poor. So for example, farmers might have no income during the dry season when crops aren't growing. Or people might run out of food and go hungry at certain times. Or they might fall ill for a period of time. Or they might lose a job, but then get a new job. They are temporarily poor. And poverty is both. It can be both chronic and it can be both temporary. Poverty can be also absolute and relative. This is also really important to understand what poverty is about. Absolute poverty means that there are some standards by which anyone Anywhere in the world is poor. There are universal global standards for poverty. Like what? Okay, somebody who is starving, not by his own choice, doesn't have enough food, that person is poor. Somebody who cannot read anywhere in the world, that person is by definition poor. Somebody who is so sick that she can't get work or can't lead a life that she wants to live, that person is poor by an absolute standard. I don't care whether you're in Norway or Niger. If you are sick and can't lead the life that you want to live, you are poor. 
Now there's also relative poverty. And what this means is that poverty is contingent. Some definitions of poverty are contingent upon a particular society. They're contextualized. Yeah, like different societies have different definitions for poverty. And you have to take this into account. We have to be careful with it. Because, I'll be honest with you guys, some people say some pretty stupid stuff about poverty. And you will hear in this country, people say things like this. Well, poor people in America, I don't know why they, they always sound like they're from Texas. <laughs> uh, poor people in America, they got it really good, right? They got schools, they got health care at the emergency room, they got plenty to eat, not like real poor people in Haiti, right? You'll actually hear people say this, okay? Um, look, maybe there's a grain of truth into it, in that, okay, yeah, so poor people in the U.S. can go to the emergency room and I don't know, a poor person in rural Haiti maybe has no medical treatment whatsoever. But the point of it is that you have to be really careful with these relative standards. And a person who's poor in the United States, you don't judge that person necessarily by the same standard as you would for somebody in Haiti. For example, that $1.25 a day line, that's absolute. In the US, the poverty line for an individual in the lower 48 states is $11,670 a year. Good luck trying to live on that in Seattle, but that's what the poverty line is. Now, if you were in Haiti and you made $11,670 a year, you live pretty well. That's true. But um, just because you'd be well off in Haiti doesn't mean that you're not poor in the US. You have to have standards that are relevant to a particular society to define poverty. Okay, and that's why even people who have a TV, who have a car, who have some basic health care could be poor in the United States. And that's why you shouldn't listen to dumb people who say that if you have those things, you're not really poor. Okay, as I've been talking about, one of the key ideas behind poverty is deprivation. Think about this for a second. What does deprivation mean? Like, just think, what does the word deprivation mean? To me, <coughs> deprivation means you don't have something that you should have, right? You don't have something that you should have. You're deprived of something. Think about it this way. There's a poverty line. Here's the poverty line. And if you're above it, up here, you're not poor. And if you're below it, down there, you are poor. If you're below the poverty line, you're deprived. You should have what people above the poverty line have, but you don't. You should be up there, but you're not. That means you're deprived of things. Deprived of things that you should have. What should you have? Ah, good question. Is it money? Is it health? Is it education? Is it a home? Is it other assets? Well, okay, maybe. But actually, a little bit. I'm gonna tell you what I think you really should have. What the real dividing line is, what the real poverty line is, okay? So poverty is deprivation but ultimately deprivation of what? Now, getting towards the end here of these definitions of poverty, poverty is a human problem. And to get at what I mean by this, I actually want to ask you guys to do me a favor. I want to take a couple minutes. I want you to do something. I want you to look at your clothes. I want you to look at the label on your clothes and find out where your garment was made. If you need to, have somebody sitting next to you look at the label. Who has a label back then, yeah? Okay, what's your name? Ryan. 
Yeah. Ryan. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, applause for Ryan. For Hey Ryan, what do you imagine about the person who made that what sweatshirt? Is it your sweatshirt that I have to live? What do you imagine about the person who made that? Probably don't live a very good life. Yeah. What do you imagine about the working conditions of the person who made that sweatshirt? Probably not the best. He said vaguely. Yes. Okay. Who said Indonesia? The Afro people in Indonesia. Um, what do you imagine about the person who made your sweatshirt or shirt or whatever from Indonesia? Um, he or she probably was like working in the factory and living in a terrible place. Yeah, other people, like what do you imagine? About life in Indonesia or life of the person who made that thing you're wearing. What do you imagine about that? Anybody, whatever, whatever you're the label was, assuming it wasn't the USA. Um, what do you imagine about the life of the person, the hands of the person who made the thing you're wearing? What do you imagine about that? About the country, the conditions, yeah. To a what kind of factory? Triangle factory, yeah, okay. And what do you mean by triangle factory? Yeah, did you guys hear that? Doors locked, exposure to dangerous materials, harsh working conditions, yeah? What else do you guys imagine about the people who made the stuff you're wearing? Yeah, right here? Well, I also expect that the kind of the process of working conditions because it's hard to get sick every day. Yeah, great point, right? The, the insecurity of their job. If they get sick, they might not get paid that day. If they don't get paid that day, maybe they don't eat that day, right? Their family doesn't eat sick, yeah? Anything else can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If they really need money, they might just have to take whatever job they can get. Yeah, great point. Please. It's not fair yet. Yeah, she says that uh, they might not think that the people who are actually going to wear this clothing that it's not fair. That, that, that frankly, you guys probably have many more options in life than the people who made the garment that you're wearing. Yeah? Yeah, just one more. Yeah, cramped living conditions, maybe not a lot of leisure time, um, no personal space, that kind of stuff, right? Like, we don't know exactly the life stories of the people that made the stuff we're wearing. The reason I had you do that is to think about it, to think about these connections, to think about the human beings, very often in the developing world, in places like Pakistan, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, Bangladesh, in some of these cases, like Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world, right? We don't think very often about the people who made the stuff that we wear. There are human beings behind these things. And that's what I mean when I say that poverty is a human problem. You should never lose sight of the human being behind this stuff. And you guys have got it. I want to tell you two stories, though. I want to tell you a story about these guys. Um, these are stone breakers in Zambia, whom I saw a couple of years ago. They sit there on the side of the road, under the hot Zambian sun, it's in Zambia's in Southern Africa, every day, and what they do is they break big rocks into littler rocks. That's their job. Um, one of the most brutal jobs that I can imagine, breaking rocks, but that's what they do. Do they want to do that job? I don't, I doubt it, right? Who would choose that? But what choice do they have? They have to survive, and so they take this brutal, unfulfilling labor just to survive. I also want to tell you a story about these women that I met a couple years ago in southern India. Um, these are... Uh oh Alright, we'll do that. 
Uh, so these women are are dotted women. So that means that they are what used to be called untouched, women, right? Like the lowest caste in India. And these women live on an island in the Indian state of Kerala, um, very close to the ocean. And their island floods during monsoon season. It's very common that people who are from a discriminated against group have the worst land, the worst living conditions. So they live, they live in this insecure area. None of these women have formal jobs. So they don't have a salary, right? Most of their husbands work as day laborers, so also really insecure labor. They're working from day to day and just hoping to get money. The women do make a little bit of money by harvesting coconuts. And the profit they make on each coconut they sell is three cents per nut. So they're not making very much money. However, to get married, if you're a girl, your family has to pay a big dowry. They have to pay the husband's family a big dowry. And dowries can run up to about 1,600 US dollars. Can you imagine trying to, amount to amass that kind of money if you're making three cents on the sale of coconut? You have to pay $1,600, and you often have to pay some gold. This impoverishes families. It puts them into massive debt that can last generations. Most of the younger women in this group actually had some education. In fact, Kerala in India has pretty good educational standards. But some of the older women had very little education and may have, may have been illiterate. Um, even the women who had some education, though, they had to usually stop at 10th grade because past that, uh, they had to pay for education and they had no money for their tuition, okay? So I tell you these stories, again, to make the human connection. Because poverty is about people's lives. It's about the life they might want to live and about the life they can't live because they're deprived, because they're poor. So what are they deprived of? They're deprived of freedom. They're deprived of choices. They're deprived of the capability to choose the life they want to live. And so that's why I say, all these things add up to a definition of poverty as <coughs> freedom. You're not free to choose. You don't have the freedom to live a life that you value. That, I think, is the fundamental and most powerful definition of poverty. And this definition of poverty actually informs this way to think about poverty. I promised that I would tell you about this way to think, a new way to think about it. And this way is called the capabilities approach. It's not strictly new, and it's been around for yeah, 20, 30 years, but the people who know about it are kind of academics and some people at high levels of global development organizations. But I think it's so important to know about this understanding of poverty, because it will change how you think about it, it will also change what you do about it. Some of you guys saw a movie that had Amartya Sen speaking, I think he's this Nobel Prize winning economist, great mind, and he's the father of this approach. It can be hard to get your head around this idea. Let me see what we can do with it, though. I want to tell you what the capabilities approach says about poverty, and it may remain foggy to you, I'm not sure, but it's really important to me to try to get word out about this understanding of poverty and um, uh, how it can hopefully change what we do about it. So there's these two definitions that I want you to know. The first is capabilities. A capability is the freedom to choose things that you might value. Okay? Um, and the functioning is like the achievement of your choice. It's putting capabilities into action. Let me try to make this concrete. It's not just can you get an education, like do you have the capability to get an education? Can you choose to get an education if you want to? Not just can you go to school, but do you go to school? So it's not just about access, it's about attainment. And let me return to that example I gave you of the woman who's suffering these multiple deprivations. Let's say she might want to be able to read, or she might want to be able to vote, but she would lack the capability because she's been denied an education. Maybe her, her culture says women don't get to go to school. She's denied the capability to get an education. On the other hand, maybe she has gotten an education. Maybe she's gone to school. But she might lack the functioning, like the attainment of things like reading and voting. 
Because maybe her family can't afford books. Or maybe her family says, yeah, you need to work all the time. No time for you for reading. Or maybe the political system she lives in says, you don't get to vote. Yeah? In that case, she's denied the attainment of her freedom. She can't put her capabilities into action. And my point here is that whether she lacks the capability or the functioning, she doesn't have the freedom to choose things that she might value. Does she want to vote but is prevented from doing so? Then she's denied something fundamental and she's poor. That means she's poor. Okay? So again, poverty equals unfreedom. Unfreedom in a variety of ways. Do people have opportunities? Do they have freedom? Do they have choice? If they don't have those things in certain areas, then they're poor. If you don't have the freedom to choose, if you don't have the freedom to live a life that you value, then you're poor. Now there's a really important question here. There's stuff that gets tricky quickly. I, think, I hope that this much you kind of get, it, right? But here's where this stuff gets tricky. And it gets back to the deprivation thing. Like, how do you identify what the fundamental freedoms are? The stuff to which every human being is entitled. Great. Um, what are the things that if you're lacking them, you're deprived? You see what I'm saying? Um, there's an idea that there are certain basic things to which every human being is entitled, but what are they? And there's a lot of debate and controversy here. It's a thing that people argue about. I'm going to present to you a short list of a couple things that have been argued as the fundamental entitlements, things to which all of us are fundamentally entitled. That's from a philosopher called Martha Nussbaum. And she says, here are the things that every human being deserves. And I'll tell you what they are. I'll you read, first of all, with life. What is she, how does she describe this? What are we talking about here? She says, being able to live to the end of a human life of normal length, not dying prematurely, or before one's life is so reduced as to be not worth living. What she's saying, the idea here, that we also have a decent life expectancy test. Um, that nobody should have to accept a life of seriously foreshortened mortality. You shouldn't have to die at 40. Then we're all entitled to live our four score and seven, that kind of thing, okay? The next thing, bodily health. Nussbaum says that we are all entitled to basic bodily health. She describes it this way. Being able to have good health, including reproductive health, to be adequately nourished, to have adequate shelter, so having enough food, having a decent shelter, and not having to worry about special susceptibility to diseases, that we're all entitled to that. The next thing she calls bodily integrity. She describes it this way. Being able to move freely from place to place, to be secure against violent assault, including sexual assault and domestic violence, having opportunities for sexual satisfaction and for choice in matters of reproduction, what this is about is, as I say here, the individual's control and control of and security for his or her own body. Freedom from assault. Having choice in reproductive matters. Nussbaum says we all deserve the freedom to make choices here. If we don't have that freedom, then we're poor. Now, from these three basic things, you might say it's kind of fuzzy. But I'll present the things that you might think are fuzzier, and let's just see what you think. The next one she says, is senses, imagination, and thought. I'll tell you how she describes this. Being able to use the senses to imagine, think, and reason, to have an adequate education, including literacy, basic mathematical and scientific training. Being able to use one's mind in ways protected by guarantees of freedom of expression with respect to both political and artistic speech and freedom of religious exercise. There's a lot here, right? But it, Basically, it is freedom of expression, it's freedom of conscious, conscience, it's freedom to have a, like the right to education. And all these things are really important, because without them, how do you think for yourself? They support this idea of practical reason, which I'll get to in one second. But the next in her list of things to which we're all entitled is freedom of emotions. She describes this as being able to have attachments to things and people outside ourselves, to, be, to, to those who love us 
to feel longing, gratitude, anger, the full complement of human emotions. So this is the idea that we should all have freedom to form intimate relationships. Okay? Practical reason. This one may sound really vague. Here's what it means. Being able to form a conception of the good and to engage in critical reflection about the planning of one's life. This entails protection for the liberty of conscience and religious observance. This is kind of like intellectual freedom. You have to be able to think for yourself. You have to make reasoned choices about what you want for your life. And then the last one of her list that I'll tell you about is called affiliation. Also sounds pretty vague, and here's what she means by it. Being able to live with and toward others, to recognize and show concern for other human beings, to engage in various forms of social interaction, to be able to imagine the situation of another, having a social basis of self-respect and non-humiliation, being able to be treated as a dignified being whose worth is equal to that of others. Again, there's a lot here. Let me boil it down. It's partly freedom of association, but it's not just freedom of association as we think about it in American political terms, where you can join a political party or join a protest organization or join whatever group. It's more than that. It's also sociability. It's the capability to have a variety of social relations and to do so without being discriminated against because of your gender, because of your race, because of your sexual orientation, because of your ethnicity, religion, or whatever. Freedom from discrimination. Okay, so do we get it? This is the list of things that according to this philosopher, all human beings are entitled to. That we should all have this. We should all have these basic freedoms. Now, I will admit it, this is, this is difficult. Yeah? Because what do these things look like in practice? What's the content of this affiliation thing? And a really tricky thing here, besides just identifying what the central capability should be, is what's the threshold of deprivation? Do you understand what I mean? Like, um, what is the minimum level of, quote, affiliation below which a person can be classified as poor? See what I'm saying? The idea is that, well, there's some basic level of practical reason to which we're all entitled, but how do you know when you fall below that? And this is debatable. This leads to arguments, controversies, even within a society. Because there's an idea that these are universal, but there's also this idea that they have to be contextualized within a society. Look, we don't even agree with them, agree on in the United States. Like, there's not agreement necessarily in the United States upon women's uh, control of their own bodies and women's reproductive rights. So, of course, there's going to be disagreement, but the disagreement can be fruitful. The idea is that there needs to be a democratic process to decide not only what the fundamental freedoms are, but also what the threshold of deprivation is. Okay. I may have lost you. I don't know. I'm hoping that if this actually interests you, you can ask me questions about it, or you can talk to me about it, or maybe you'll even talk about it in your classes afterwards. But let me tell you really quickly why I think the capabilities approach is so important. Why thinking about poverty in this way is so vital. And that's because it's both more accurate and it's fairer. It's more accurate because it's multidimensional. It's not as reductionist as money. This is a really broad understanding of poverty, which is important. And it's also fairer. What I mean by that is that this multidimensional capabilities approach is fairer to people who are poor because it is more respectful of a range of potential deprivations. It acknowledges that people can suffer in all kinds of different ways besides not having enough money. That people can suffer if their senses, their imagination, and their thought is restricted or oppressed. And if you follow from this idea of poverty, as I've alluded to, I think it could lead us to not just thinking about poverty in a new way, but in doing about poverty in a different way. In other words, helping to reduce poverty in different ways. And so, much to your happiness and gratification, I'll get to the last part of my talk now. And that is this. How do we help people escape poverty? How do we reduce poverty? And I want to offer you a couple thoughts. And the first thing, the first thought in terms of how do we reduce poverty? Find out what poor people want. Here's why this is important. Because in rich countries, very often, 
People want to help poor people. People in rich countries want to help poor people without understanding what people who are living in poverty actually want for themselves, what they want or need. <coughs> and reducing poverty should not be about what we in rich countries want to give poor people in poor countries. It shouldn't be like, oh, I'm going to buy top shoes because they give shoes to people in poor countries. Did anybody ask if the people in poor countries want top shoes? I doubt it. Yeah? So the point is, reducing poverty should be about helping poor people meet the needs that they have, the desires that they have, and not the uh, desires that we in the rich country, these rich countries have. Now luckily, there's some good research here. That same World Bank study that interviewed 20,000 poor people around the world found out, according to the study anyway, what it was that poor people wanted. And here's what they wanted. They said they wanted security and assets and livelihoods. What does that mean? It means they want legal title to their land and possessions. Like that slump that I visited that I told you about at the beginning, those people who didn't own their land, they didn't have basic security. They want that. People want legal title. They want secure jobs. They want secure sources of income. According to this study, poor people said they want access to infrastructure and services. That means they want access to schools, to clinics, to hospitals, to adequate shelter, to roads, transport, to clean water, to sanitation. Poor people said important to them was good health. Now think about it this way. The body may be the poor person's main or only asset. Those stone breakers in Zambia, I bet they don't own a lot of other things. They don't have control a lot of other things other than their body. So that's their main asset, the main way they can make money. If they don't have good health, then they can't survive. Poor people also said they wanted to share in decision making. Because so often poor people report themselves to be excluded, to be impotent, to be disempowered and ignored. They want to have their voices heard. They want to share in decision making. Also according to this study, poor people said they wanted equity and harmony for different genders and different ethnic groups. That means legal protections. If you are not from the majority ethnic group, you should have a legal protection for your status. If you are from a sexual minority, you should have legal protection. That means anti-discrimination campaigns to prevent prejudice. It means education, opportunities which accrue to everyone regardless of their race, caste, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, whatever, okay? And people also said they wanted peace and fair treatment. They wanted security from violence. They wanted more effective policing. They want protection from crime. They want protection from corruption and abuse. This is what poor people said they wanted. Now there's good news here. In addition to the sort of bad news that like, too often the West says, here's what we're gonna give you, we are what you want. There is some good news here. And that some things are working to help poor people achieve these things. There is hope. And I think some of you guys have already heard of the Millennium Development Goals, right? Have you heard of them? And if you haven't already, you will study them, I think. So the Millennium Development Goals are a set of eight basic targets um, to reduce poverty around the world by the year 2015, so coming up very soon. And these Millennium Development Goals are criticized, but they're also useful for um, channeling global energies. And we have made progress here. As a planet, we have made progress. As a species, we have made progress. And I want to show you this quick video, hopefully it will work, um, about the progress we've made with the Millennium Development Goals. It should fill you with some kind of optimism, I hope.
Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of optimism that things are actually happening that are pretty good. There's a lot of progress that we still have to make, but progress is being made. And to wrap up here, I want to tell you about three organizations that are making progress, and then to suggest to you, well, what can you do about all this kind of stuff? I want to tell you about, briefly, some organizations that are working at the global, the national, and the local levels to help reduce poverty. The first one is right here in Seattle. Anybody heard of PATH? Yeah, I know. Mr. Severson has. Um, PATH is one of the best global health organizations in the world. And they're headquartered right here in Seattle. PATH is doing great things along a lot of different projects. One of them, though, is combating malaria. Um, malaria is a huge problem. Like 620,000 people in the world every year die because of malaria. Most of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa and most of them are kids. And it's horrible. And this one, I can speak from experience. I didn't die, but I had malaria a couple years ago in Ghana. And it's the sickest I've ever been. You don't want it. All you can pretty much do is lay there and puke. And then when you're done puking, because you have nothing else left to puke, you lay there and maybe die, or if you're lucky, go to the hospital. Malaria is awful. But PATH is doing great work to develop um, treatments for malaria to help get the malaria medications to places where it's harder to reach. They're helping to track malaria cases to actually identify areas where there's malaria outbreaks. And then perhaps most importantly, they're a part of this worldwide campaign to develop a malaria vaccine. And that would be a major leap forward for the human race if we can actually have a vaccine to eliminate malaria. Because here's the thing. Still this year, even though deaths are reduced, still this year, 200 million people will get sick from malaria worldwide. 200 million people. And if we can have a vaccine against it, that will make so many people's lives better. There's also this organization, Pratham, which is the largest non-governmental organization in India. It works at the national level, just in India, and they do fantastic work. They work in education. Here's the problem. 20% of children 6 to 14 in India are still not in school. And something like 90 million women in India remain illiterate. If you're from the, a different caste, you might not get to go to school. If you're a girl, you might not get to go to school. If you're from a really poor family and you're a kid, your family might make you work rather than go to school. Pratham is working to change all those things. I visited some of their programs uh, in Mumbai a few years ago and it was great. You go into these parts of Mumbai where there's very high concentrations of poverty and Pratham has set up these education centers where kids are either getting supplemental education, like they're going before or after school to work on their math, to work on their reading, to work on their English. They are getting skills, they're getting trained in computers, they're being given books to read. And the other really cool thing is that the Pratham teachers are often not government teachers. They're women from the local communities who might not have a teaching degree, like all your teachers do. They're women who might not have had a lot of other opportunities, but they want to teach, and they want to contribute, and they want to give back to their communities. So Pratham is helping not only to educate Indian kids and doing great work there, it's also helping empower the women, and helping them help their communities. And then the last organization, which is really inspirational, is called Kinanando, and they work in Guatemala. The problem here is that Guatemala had a civil war for 36 years in which 200,000 people were killed and 83% of the people killed were Maya, from the Maya indigenous group. And nowadays, Guatemala has terrible rates of gender-based violence. Apparently, it still ranks third in the world for the number of murders of women. And so, Generando works to empower women, trying to end gender-based violence. They are teaching women to become advocates for themselves. They're giving training for government officials, for teachers, for civil society level leaders, and for just girls and women who lead ordinary lives, trying to end gender-based violence, trying to empower women, trying to end marginalization. Now, last year, a group of Seattle University professors and students went down to evaluate Kenanando's impact, and they took pictures of some of Kenanando's beneficiaries. I just want you to see Again, the faces of the women who have benefited, the faces of the women who maybe suffered discrimination, suffered gender-based violence, and are now doing better because of the work of an organization like Canada that 
you know, you, they're not famous, right? But they're doing good work. They're helping indigenous girls learn about their rights. They're helping other women prevent pregnancy. They're helping all these girls improve their self-esteem. There's really great testimonies um, of girls who, before Hanedango's programs, might have just envisioned for themselves becoming a homemaker and not continuing with school and having very limited opportunities in life. But now these girls say, I want to go on to college. The first person I generate in my family to go to college. I want to become an artist. I want to become a social worker. I want to become a teacher. They have dreams. They have an idea of the kind of life they want to live. And that is something that Canadango is helping them to acquire. And that, my friends, that is empowerment. That is helping them to achieve a life they want to live. Okay. So those are some inspirational stories. And to wrap up, what should you do? What can you guys, high school students, what can you do about this? Well, I hope you'll be able to talk about this in your classes. But let me offer you some ideas. Just a couple ideas. Um, and these ideas are in rank order of easiness, in the sense that the first don't take much commitment, and the last one actually takes more commitment. The first thing you can do, give money to a worthy organization. Like one of these three, like Prop, like PATH, like Canada, like I don't know whatever else, whatever organization you might like, you know, Oxfam, Amnesty International. Um, I say this is kind of easy because, you know, whether or not you have all, uh, that much money, this is the typical thing that people in America do. It's like, oh yeah, I gave a hundred bucks last year to Amnesty International, and eh, I'm covered, right? Get out, of, get out of jail free card. I gave. Hey, it's better than nothing, but could you do more? I say you could. The next thing you could do is something people don't like to think about. Make your different choices in your daily life. Here's why people don't like to think about it. Because it means things like reducing your carbon consumption. Uh, unless you're a Neanderthal, you recognize that climate change is happening, that humans have a uh, responsibility for it, and that uh, the people who are going to be most adversely affected by climate change are poor people around the world. And so that means reducing carbon consumption in the rich countries. It means driving less. It means trying to uh, convert to renewable sources of energy. It means recycling and reusing. It even means things like shop fair trade, right? Whether you're buying Theo chocolate, you know Theo chocolate, right? Um, fair trade coffee, fair trade bananas, fair trade stuff, the idea is that it's actually designed to help small producers in developing countries rather than great big agro-business. So if you make different choices, that's a commitment that's going to help you help other people. If you're even more interested in that, there's study programs. Anybody heard of Global Visionaries? Yeah, some people have. Uh, Seattle-based organization has its Global Brigades. Global Visionaries and Global Brigades offer uh, temporary study programs where you can go and learn about international development. You can even go and do development work. I know people who run both these organizations and they're really, really recommendable. If you're interested in this stuff, check out Global Visionaries. Um, you can really learn a lot and have a life-changing experience and help reduce poverty in another country. In terms of study programs, Hey, think about college, right? Maybe you're really interested in this and you want to study international studies. So you want to study international development in college. Of course, I would love to see that because then you can go get a really interesting, um, rewarding job in development and poverty reduction. And there's incredible careers out there with that. So I hope you would consider actually making this kind of life vocation too. Um, maybe even harder than that is educating. Educating other people. Tell people about this stuff. Tell people how you can reconceive of poverty so it's not just about money, but it's about rights and choices. Talk to your family, talk to your friends. If you're a member of a church or a mosque or a synagogue or whatever, talk to people there. If you're you know, a member of Scouts or some other organization, give a talk. Tell people what poverty is and how we can do something about it. Help combat misunderstandings, because there's plenty of misunderstandings. You will hear people in this country all the time say stuff like, oh, poor people are lazy, right? or government assistance for the poor just makes them dependent. Um, or that foreign aid money just goes down a rat hole. Those things are wrong, right? And you can help educate people to know that they're wrong. Now, lastly, if you're really fired up, you can advocate. This means talking to people in power. Politicians, I don't know what, mayors, city council, um, leaders of various kinds and telling them 
hey, look, we need to make some changes here. The um, congressman for this district is Adam Smith. I know probably most of you guys aren't old enough to vote, but Adam Smith is your congressman, probably, if you're living around here somewhere. Uh, he's an okay guy. I've met him a number of times. He will listen to you. If you send him an email, he will actually listen to you. Yes, do politicians in D.C. spend a fair amount of time listening to uh, lobbyists from gigantic corporations? Yeah. But they will also listen to their constituents. And I urge you to take advantage of that. They will listen to you. What do you tell them? Well, you can tell them to increase federal funding for development assistance. Do you guys know um, how much the U.S. federal budget allocates every year to international development assistance? Yeah, less than most, yeah. Most Americans, when asked this question, say this. They say that 28% of the U.S. federal budget goes to foreign aid, 28%. You know the actual number? 0.19%. 0.19% goes to development aid. And most Americans say 28%. Tells you most Americans have no idea what they're talking about. Um, if you advocate, you can say to people in power, you ask them, is policy helping those who are already well off? Or is it helping the people who are disadvantaged? Is policy supporting big industrial farmers in the United States? Or is it helping farmers around the world who actually probably need more help? Right? These are questions that people need to ask. Now, what comes out of this? What would the world look like if there were different? If we actually understood poverty as about freedoms and choices and capabilities, and if we worked to help poor people realize what they want to realize. Well, I'm going to go back to where I started. I'm going to go back to that slum. That slum was the, the largest slum in India, and according to some measures, the largest slum in Asia. It's called Dharabi. It's in Mumbai. Um, it's partially famous because it was set, some of Slumdog Millionaire was filmed there, if you've seen Slumdog Millionaire. Um, and as I said, for so many people in Dharabi, they don't have choices. They don't get to lead, to lead the kind of life that they might want to live. They are lacking fundamental freedoms. And so what I would want for them, let's skip past this, is I would want for them to have the freedoms that they should have. I would want for these kids in Dharabi, these school kids in Dharabi, I would want for them to be able to live the life that they would want to live. To be able to make the choices so that they get out of life what they want out of life. I hope that is what this understanding of poverty will help you, not only intellectually, but to help you ethically and to help you be better citizens so that you're working so that poor people around the world actually have more freedom and are not constrained in their freedom. And so that these kids in Dharabi, in India, actually have more freedom than their parents did and can hopefully escape poverty. So thank you guys so much for listening to me. Um, I think we have some time for questions, yeah? So like 10 minutes for questions about whatever. If you guys have questions, let me know. Yeah, please. That was from a survey that was done by the Pew Research Center asking Americans what they thought the number would be. So, yeah, it's a public opinion, yeah. Go ahead again. Oh boy, that's a controversial question. Um, I, uh, hmm, I could get in trouble. So, be wary of, um, hmm, yeah, I don't want to paint too broad strokes. Be wary of some organizations for whom their uh, religious dogma um, clouds their program. Um, and I don't think I will, I'll, I'll talk to you individually if you want to know, um, but I don't want to say that out loud here because some people may get mad at me. Um, but there are some organizations where, let's say, they force the Bible on people, or they force the Quran on people, and um, that's not right in my view. So there are some great religiously based organizations that do great work too, but there are some that are more about proselytizing than they are about actually um, reducing poverty. Um, yeah.
Lack of administration fees, yeah, it's a great question. So um, in terms of giving money to um, nonprofits, there are some like good websites like Charity Navigator and that kind of stuff. And one of the metrics that's used to evaluate a good charity is how much they spend on administration fees. That's important to consider that, right? Um, it can't be your only consideration because um, you know what's the right amount to spend on administration fees? It can really vary from organization to organization. But I do like, I think it's Charity Navigator, where they actually rate organizations by stars. Uh, and if you get four stars, you're like a top class organization that really spends the money on programs. It's really efficient with use of money and maybe not spending money on mailings and that kind of stuff. And I mean, if you've ever given money to Amnesty International, as I have, I mean, Amnesty does really good work, but then for the rest of your life, you're going to get junk mail from Amnesty International. And so they're spending money on like junk mail. Um, so you have to be careful with that number about the administrative fees. Don't use it as the only criterion, but it is worth considering when you're looking at organizations to be like, yeah, how about down here? Yeah, Habitat for Humanity, and when a bunch of people from rich countries go and like build homes for people in less developed countries. Um, in broad terms, very often those kind of experiences are more about helping the young people or the volunteers from rich countries than they are about helping the, kind of the people in the, in the developing world. Because it's what you learn, it's how you feel better about yourself by giving back. Um, so that's not to say they're bad or wrong or anything like that. Um, but, you know, uh, there's the old saying, right, uh, teach a man to fish um, rather than just giving him a fish, whatever the exact saying is. And so if you just giving a person a house, it helps, right? It's, uh, it's, it can be something. But don't imagine that um, that's a solution that is really sustainable uh, and that can really work on a broad scale because what you want to do, ideally, is employ local labor so that they have money and buy local material materials which are supporting people there rather than just showing up and like, here we built you a house, hey, see you again in a couple years, right? So uh, they can be good. I don't want to say they're all bad, but um, they're often more about learning for the people who participate on the programs and for the people who benefit from the house that gets built. And second question? Yeah, sure. So Global Visionaries um, takes students to Guatemala, and they specifically for high school students, and um, they have like leadership trainings. You go down, and it's cultural exchange. So you 